Today I'm going to talk about the MSI Tomahawk B350 motherboard for Ryzen. So if a Tomahawk is a type of single-handed axe, would that make me some type of Gimli? No, I, I don't think so. I think they're referring to the Tomahawk missile based on the cover of the box. but. The missile is probably also based on the single-handed axe, and the word tomahawk is uh, from a Native American uh, language, I believe. So yeah, Ryzen. Anyway, already off the rails. This is a B350 motherboard. This is actually the first B350 motherboard that I've gotten a chance to take a look at for the Ryzen platform. That is Socket AM4. It's designed for AMD uh, Ryzen CPUs. Well, any AM4 CPU, there's probably gonna be others other than Ryzen that aren't out yet. Probably some type of APU, probably some type of, you know, four core something that uh, is maybe not exactly Ryzen. Maybe that'll be called Athlon. I don't know. There was, that was a rumor on, on Reddit today, so who knows? So I've got the B350 set up on my test bench here, uh, but, but before we discuss the uh, review and testing findings, let's take a look at the physical connections on this motherboard and the physical layout of this motherboard. All right, let's run through the ports on the back. First, we've got a combo PS2 mouse keyboard port. We've got two USB 2 ports, and then we've got an array of video ports. Now, do keep in mind that these video ports will not work unless you've got a CPU that's got built-in video, so an APU, basically. If you get a Ryzen 7 or Ryzen 5 and it doesn't explicitly, well, it doesn't have built-in video, uh, at least at the time of this video. I mean, conceivably, they might come out with something later, but it's probably gonna be labeled APU, and it's probably gonna say what the integrated video is. So keep that in mind, that if you get a Ryzen 7 or a Ryzen 5, the video ports aren't gonna do anything. Uh, then we've got a bunch of USB 3.1 ports. Now we do have a USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type-C port and a Type-A port. Then we have our integrated LAN, which is provided by a Realtek Gigabit Ethernet controller. Uh, and then below that we have two more USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports. Next to that we have our six analog audio ports, which is provided by a Realtek um, ALC892. Uh, it's sort of an older audio codec, but uh, nevertheless, it gets the job done. Sort of going clockwise around the board, this is a full ATX motherboard. We've got our eight pin CPU power connector, our first CPU fan connector, then we've got our four DDR4 DIMM slots. Now I did test the DDR4 um, ECC functionality under Linux, and even with ECC memory, Linux reports that ECC is not enabled. So something about the board or the UEFI does not support error correcting ECC memory. On the front edge of the motherboard, we've got two more four pin fan headers, along with a motherboard connector. And then we have four built-in SATA 6, six gigabit per second ports. The motherboard also features two USB 3.0 front panel headers. Now, well, it's technically USB 3.1 Gen 1, but it's the five gigabit standard, the normal you know, USB 3 front panel connector. There are two of them on this board, one of which is on the front and the other is on the bottom. Also just below the SATA ports, we've got another four pin fan header. You get your front panel connectors, the other USB 3 header I was telling you about, two more USB 2.0 headers for you know, extra USB 2 headers or if your case has you know, front panel USB 2 or you have an internal radiator that has a USB 2 type connection, you can plug it in there. Then we've got a blast from the past, an LPT port, a line printer port. Uh, it does not come with the cable for an LPT port, but all of the hardware is there if you're gonna run LPT. There's also uh, a serial header as well. So you can have a, a real honest to God RS-232 serial and a real, you know, your, you know, a real honest to God ECP EPP parallel port if you so desire. And of course we've got one more fan header and of course, of course we have an RGB header because everybody and their brother has RGB functionality. Let's talk about the expansion slots. Now we've got one by 16 slot which is directly wired into the CPU. That is a by 16 electrical and it is always a by 16 electrical, whatever peripheral that you're running in there. Then we have two uh, PCI Express by one slots that are connected to the, uh, the B350 chipset. We've also got another by four PCI Express slot um, just below the graphics card. Now the manual does say that you can run Crossfire with this motherboard. I was able to install a Radeon RX 480 and a Radeon RX 460 boot to Windows and use both graphics adapters in Windows. Um, it does say that Crossfire is supported in you know, like you know, GPU configurations if you want to run Crossfire through the connections. However, I was not able to boot Linux with um, SVT, that's the AMD virtualization technology, enabled with both graphics cards installed 
um, I would get a kernel panic and AMD VI timeouts when I was actually booting the machine. Uh, there's also two PCI, old school PCI um, connections that are, that are bridged in here. So if you have really old PCI peripherals that you need to be able to use, you've got two PCI slots that you can use with your peripherals. The motherboard also features an M.2 slot, which again is wired directly into the CPU. That is a PCI Express 3.0 by four connection. Uh, the placement of the slot is unfortunate because depending on what kind of GPU you have, there may not be a lot of airflow in that area. I've got a Radeon RX 480 installed, and when I did some testing with the Toshiba RD400 in a case, uh, the Toshiba RD400 did heat up quite a bit because there was really not a lot of airflow because this blower style cooler is sort of blocking the M.2. So keep that in mind if you're gonna be running a, a higher performance M.2 with this motherboard. So let's talk about my experiences with this motherboard. Now right now I've got a Thermaltake Contact Silent 12 CPU cooler installed along with a Ryzen 1700X. Uh, it's running at 3.9 gigahertz, which is actually really impressive when you consider the B350 board's you know, four plus two power delivery. This is a value oriented board. It is not you know, designed to be everything for everyone and every single use case. Um, I did not find it to be all that great to use on Linux, and I'll, I'll cover Linux in a minute, but on Windows, it was perfectly fine. I was able to overclock the CPU to 3.9, uh, even though it's only got a relatively modest four plus two power delivery system. Uh, the voltage regulation area did get quite hot, so if you're gonna use a, a fancier you know, liquid cooler or something like that, be aware uh, of the heat produced in that area and that you will need some kind of airflow from a system fan or a rear chassis fan or something over that area. But I think that really speaks to Ryzen's efficiency. I mean, we're talking about 95 watt thermal design power CPUs and you know, you really, I mean, when you brass tacks of it, you really don't need that fancy of a power delivery system unless you're going for an extreme overclock. And the overclocking headroom on Ryzen, you know, really isn't there. I have personally been able to hit 4.1 and 4.2 gigahertz on Ryzen parts, but it's taken a lot of fiddling and, and that sort of thing. Um, the review on this motherboard was also delayed a little bit um, because it took a little bit for the UEFI to get some of the kinks worked out. I worked with uh, MSI engineers and we sort of went down a punch list of, of stuff on the board and they did send me a UEFI that should be publicly available by the time the, the board is released um, that resolves all of the issues. Uh, they also added an IOMMU option to help me troubleshoot some of the Linux stuff and that uh, with the IOMMU option I was able to boot into Linux successfully uh, but I was not able to pass through a GPU with this motherboard for, for whatever reason. I suspect that if I mix uh, unlike GPUs, so instead of trying two Radeon GPUs, if I was using a, a really old Radeon GPU and a newer Radeon GPU, that would probably work. Or an NVIDIA GPU and a Radeon GPU, that would probably also work. Um, I did not have time to try those configurations with it. Uh, but otherwise, performance on Linux was good. Overall though, the board was pretty solid. I put it through a sort of a grueling burn-in test for 48 hours, running benchmarks continuously and things like that with the 4.8 gigahertz overclock. I actually used the other test bench, the all-enclosed test bench uh, with a 140 millimeter cooler sort of blowing over the motherboard. That worked really well. I like the layout of the expansion slots. Uh, you've got an ample room between the CPU and this first by 16 slot, there's a by one slot in there. But if you're using an oversized cooler, like a Noctua, like the D15 or something like that, you've got plenty of room for a cooler like that uh, and a, you know, a full size graphics card or even a graphics card with a back plate. So if you're looking to build an inexpensive system, I mean, B350 boards like this are really, really affordable. If this board worked a little better in Linux, it's probably something that I would use with like the Ryzen 1700. The Ryzen 1700 is a tremendous value and this board is really inexpensive for what you get. So B350 plus 1700, it's a pretty good combination. I'm a little disappointed that ECC memory doesn't work. That could actually be a software problem. We could actually see a UEFI update in the future that enables ECC functionality. But, uh, you know, I don't know, time will tell. I'll try to update the description or revisit this. I think this motherboard is also one that I want to revisit after the UEFI matures and after APUs come out. So don't be surprised if you see this motherboard in a review again in the future, because uh, if you can get, you know, a four core APU uh, that has pretty good performance, this might make it a good Linux system as well. 
If you're not interested in PCI Express pass-through and you want to build a Linux workstation around the, uh, the Ryzen 1700, as long as your UEFI is up to date, you should be fine. Now in terms of memory testing, I was not able to get past DDR4-2933. I used the, uh, the HyperX DDR4-3000 kit and I also used the G-Skill Trident Z kit um, that has worked at DDR4-3200 on the X370 chipset and I was not able to get the memory to run at DDR4-3200 even after fiddling with it for a bit. I was however able to get DDR4-2933. I suspect that updated UEFIs will enable more functionality there. I see no reason uh, why the board would not work that high. In fact, the, the manual says it supports up to DDR4-3200. Overall, my opinion on this board is colored positively because of the cost. Looking at the features that you get for the motherboard, it is a tremendous value. But if you need some of the other features, like some of the really cool features of Ryzen, you may want to look to a board that has a little bit more features. You may want to look to the MSI Titanium or something like that based on the X370. Although the X370, you know, it lets you run SLI, but I don't know how many people are really gonna run SLI. You can also run, you know, a high performance PCI Express peripheral, which would be my use case. So, you know, I don't know. If you're building a, a single operating system workstation, or you're gonna dual boot between Windows and Linux, it's not bad, and it's hard to argue with the price. It really is. I also think that the issues that I do have with the board can be resolved with software updates. Uh, and if they are resolved, then I will update the description below. That said, you know, the peripherals did work in Linux, networking worked, the sound worked. Um, not sure really what else to test. I mean, the SATA controller worked, NVMe works because that's just PCI Express. There's not really a lot else on the board to test. Honestly, the most surprising thing about the board is the voltage delivery system works fine. So if you pick up one of these, add to our collective memory in the community forums at level1techs.com because nothing is better than sort of the shared experiences of the community. So if you bought one, let us know what your experiences are. If you're thinking about buying one, let us know what your criteria is because that helps improve products for the future. I'm Wendell, I'm gonna be on the forums at Level 1 Techs, and I'll see you there.